Today we're going to rework the carburetor on this 1954 Johnson Seahorse outboard motor. These motors were built to last back in the 50s, so this is a real simple, easy piece of equipment to work on. So let's get started. Okay, the first thing you want to do is certainly remove the cover. These little pegs here actually twist out, and that's used for getting the front piece of the cover off. Before you get started, it's always good to take a couple of pictures so you know exactly how all these linkages and everything go back together. The next thing we're going to do is go ahead and take the screws out of these dials on the front. One of them is the choke, and you have the high and the low speed settings. Next, go ahead and pull this faceplate off, and be careful because there's some springs on both of those stems right there. These springs just pull right off the front, just like that. There's also a little rubber grommet that may be on actually both of them. I'm missing the one up here. Next, go ahead and take the screws out of this air muffler that's on the front of the carburetor. This air muffler is an integral part of this piece of equipment because since there's no lower cowling on this motor, any water that splashes up could possibly go down the throat of the carburetor. So this puts the air draw up to the top of the engine area to keep it from sucking up any water that might splash up under the cowling. After getting these first two screws out of the front, there's actually a third screw that's right back here on this little piece of metal. Although it's a little bit hard to get to because of this rewind starter, it might be easier to actually take the screw out right right here, which is the other side of that linkage. Now this whole piece should actually just slide right off the front. Next, go ahead and remove this hose that goes on the bottom of the carburetor bowl. Next, we're going to take these bolts off that hold the carburetor on. This linkage is a little bit in the way. So actually, if you pull this piece of rubber down, it'll get that linkage out of the way. And now you have a good clear shot on that half inch nut. On the other side, this one's pretty accessible. The only thing you might take out of the way, if you take this piece off, you'll have a little bit more turn on that carburetor nut as you're trying to get it out. Once you have both of your carburetor mounting nuts off, you can actually loosen the screw on the top of this linkage right here. And then this linkage will actually slide sideways off of this rod that goes right into the butterfly valve. You'll probably have to go and pull the carburetor most of the way off before this linkage though will slide all the way off that rod. Be sure to shove a paper towel in the front of this carburetor hole so that way that no debris or bugs or anything can get down inside your motor. Now that we have the carburetor off, there's actually five screws that go into the bottom of this bowl. This is the carburetor bowl right here. So we'll go and take these five screws out. Next we're going to spin this nut underneath this glass bowl. This thing will actually pivot out of the way. And then this glass bowl will actually come off of there. There's a screw in the bottom of where the glass bowl is. And we're going to take this out next. There's a small flat type washer that was underneath that one. And now we're ready to go ahead and separate this carburetor bowl. Okay, as it comes apart, you'll notice you may have some dried up oil gas in the bottom of it. Hey, we'll be back in a little over 60 seconds, and we're going to pause real quick to see if you need any eternal repair. You might say, eternal repair? What's that? Well, hey, consider your whole life, and all your life, have you ever told a lie before? I have, and I'm sure you have too. We all have. Also consider, have you ever stolen something, even no matter how small it was? I'm sure you have, and I have too. The whole point of where I'm going with this is those two rules, lying and stealing, those are two of the Ten Commandments in the Bible which define what sin is. So if you've broken even one of those rules, no matter how small it was, that means you've sinned, and we all have. The punishment for sin is going to hell, or eternal separation from God. The good news is Jesus Christ came to this earth. He didn't lie. He didn't steal. He didn't do all these crazy stuff that you and I have done. He was totally without sin. He was sacrificed on the cross for my personal sin and yours. He went to the grave. Three days later, he defeated death, and now he sits beside the Father in heaven. The whole point of why he had to take that punishment on the cross was he was taking the punishment for your sin and for my sin. But it can only be accounted to you if through faith you believe in who he was, what he did, you submit to him as your Lord, and you repent. And when you do that, you can have eternal habitation with Jesus and the rest of the saints for eternity in heaven. You might be saying to yourself, hey, I'm a good person. Surely God wouldn't send me to hell for all the nice things I've done for people. But the truth of the matter is the Bible says, by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man or woman should boast. There is no amount of good work you can do to earn your righteousness before God. Only faith and trust in what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Hey, let's get back to our video, and I'll have a little more information on the eternal portion of this at the end of the video. This right here is what they call a float switch. There's a metal pin right there that will push out and this float switch will come off. The purpose of the float switch is there's a needle valve right there. And as the, as the gas level in the bowl goes up, the float goes up and it shuts the gas off. As the motor burns the gas, the float will go down, allowing more gas to come into the bowl area. This is how the motor regulates how much gas it needs. Usually this pin will just push right out of here, but if this thing's been sitting for a long time and it's gotten a lot of dried up gas inside the edges of it, you may have to take a small nail or something 
and just tap it just a teeny bit just to push it out the other side. It can go out from either direction. You can see now just by tapping on it just a little bit, it's starting to come out on this side right here. Then just grab some pliers and grab onto the end of it and pull it out just like that. Being very careful with the float. So there's the pin right there. Now, being very careful with this float because this seat pin is attached by a little wire right here. And as you lift this up out of the way, there is your float valve right there. The float valve will have a rubber tip on it, and you'll want to inspect this rubber tip to see if there's any ridge or gouging in it, and or if it's gotten really super hard and it's not very flexible. This would be the one of the most integral parts that you might have to replace on this carburetor. Next, we're going to screw this jet out of here. It actually just spins right out with a flathead screwdriver. Very commonly, these will get plugged up with old get dried up gas. There's going to be a hole right there on the side of it, and you'll want to check to see if, if there's anything plugging that hole. It also should be hollow all the way through the center of it. So likewise, if there's anything plugging the length of it also, we're going to blow this out with some carburetor cleaner here shortly. Next, we're going to remove this upper jet. But before we remove it, we'll even take a Sharpie, mark the positioning on the top of the jet stem, and then come over to your casement and also mark it there so you kind of know how those two lined up before you do any adjusting to it. Next, go ahead and screw it clockwise inward and count how many rotations. You probably only got about a seven eighths of a rotation and we're gonna write that down because when we go to reinstall this, we'll bring it right back down to where it stops and then we'll back it back out, the seven eighths. And we're gonna do the same thing on the lower jet stem valve, marking both the casing and the stem valve. Now we're gonna screw it all the way in until it comes to a stopping point. If they're a little stiff, you can go ahead and reinstall the handle on the end of the valve and then just turn it all the way until it stops. On this particular one, we made about a 5 sixteenths of a rotation. And after doing that, now we can back it all the way out and remove the stem, knowing where exactly to reset it to when we put this thing back together after we've blown out all these chambers with carburetor cleaner. So once you get it out, here's what it looks like. It'll have a tip on it, and these tips are going to be solid metal. There's not any rubber on the tip of that. Make sure you take note when you take these out because they are interchangeable by thread, but not by tip design. So the one with the long bullet tip is the upper one, and the one with the blunt tip was the lower one. When you look down the barrel of the carburetor, you'll notice that there's some little small pinholes in the ceiling of this carburetor, and those are the ones that allow the gas to flow into this thing as the butterfly valve opens and shuts. So when you're blowing these things out, you want to make sure that all of those holes are free and clear of any debris. Next, we're going to take our carb cleaner, and this has a long stem on it like this that we can shove down some of these holes. We're going to insert them into several of these holes, which we've taken these pins and jets out of. And by covering this so it doesn't spray in your face, go ahead and kick, go ahead and take a couple blasts, and you'll see it comes out other areas. Make sure you do all of them. Also have where those front needle valves came out. Then we'll also stick the hose inside this lower jet hole and we'll go ahead and blow it out. And you can also do a spray down in general, just the whole carburetor area inside it. Being very careful this stuff doesn't spray back in your face. In the bottom of the bowl, the carburetor cleaner will dissolve that dried up gas that kind of made a crusty mess in the bottom to begin with. Sometimes even an old toothbrush will help to kind of break up a lot of the stuff that's in the bottom of these carburetor bowls. also need to take this jet, the one that I told you had the little small hole in the side of it. Let's go ahead and take our carburetor cleaner, put down the throat of that, blast through it, put your finger on both sides with the thing in the side, and it'll shoot out the sides. Now that we've gotten everything cleaned up, let's go ahead and reassemble everything in reverse order. Usually if you're careful, this gasket can be reusable. Now reinstalling the needle valves, go ahead and spin them in until they hit bottom, and then as we have it written down how many rotations to back out, we'll take this thing back out just that amount. There's a gasket on the throat of the carburetor also, and usually if you're careful, this gasket doesn't get damaged and you can reuse that one also. Likewise, once you reinstall these knobs, go ahead and spin them all the way till they get to where they stop, and then reopen them right to the same number of revolutions that you wrote down earlier when you took the carburetor apart. I've gotten everything reassembled now. I have not hooked up the hose yet to the bottom of this carburetor, and I'm going to go ahead and pump some gas through this hose in case there's any dried up crusty stuff inside the hose. I can flush the hose before I hook it up to the carburetor. It's also not a bad idea to put some type of inline filter in your 
intake gas, and that way you can keep any type of crummy stuff from getting back inside the carburetor and gumming it up. Once you've gotten started and you're out running it, then you can use these adjustments to kind of fine tune your slow speed and your high speed adjustment. Hey, as far as the eternal portion I was talking about, if you're not sure you know who God is, I encourage you to just to pray like this. Say, Lord Jesus, if you were real and you were out there, I pray you would reveal yourself to me in a tangible way. And when you make that prayer, he's going to answer it, and you will know he is real. At the point you know he is real, and you're ready to accept him as your Lord and Savior, the gospel is so simple. All you have to do is just pray like this. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that you are the Son of God. You took the price for my personal sin on the cross. I surrender my will to your will as Lord of my life. I repent of my sin. Thank you for loving me, forgiving me, and accepting me into your eternal habitation. That's just how simple it is. But the catch is that just saying those words won't do anything for you, only unless the heart believes the words that you're speaking. For the Bible says in Romans 10:9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord, which I just did, and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation only comes through faith and believing. Hey, if you get a chance, visit our website, eternalrepair.com, where we have a lot more information about your walk with Jesus Christ. That's eternalrepair.com. Thanks for watching.